Welcome to E3 Rehab. I'm Dr. Mark Sertica, physical therapist, and I did Jefferson curls for 30 days straight in the month of September. So let's talk about it. I have never performed Jefferson curls regularly. Prior to this, I've probably done them a handful of times randomly over the past few years. So this was definitely an interesting experiment for me, especially since I wouldn't consider myself a very flexible or mobile person. I decided to start with a 45 pound kettlebell for three sets of five repetitions. And my plan was to gradually increase reps and weight until the 30 days were over. However, adding one to two reps per set significantly increased the amount of time I spent doing them. So I just started adding five pounds every day. My dumbbells go up to 70 pounds each, but I ended up stopping my progression at 50 pounds each or 100 pounds total for two reasons. One, I've heard recommendations to build up to half of your body weight, and I weigh about 165 pounds, so I met that criteria or actually exceeded it. But the primary reason is that this exercise requires a lot more technique than I imagined, so I wanted to focus on the quality of the movement. Initially, I was standing at the head of my bench, which was wobbly, so I smartened up and used the seat, which had significantly less wiggle to it. And I was trying to focus on keeping my knees relatively straight while really rounding through my spine, but it was still extremely tricky for me, especially with the big blocky dumbbells. I felt like I was working really hard to maintain my balance and often had to look down at where the dumbbells were when they were out in front of me so they weren't hitting the bench. The absolute best setup was when I had the opportunity to use a barbell at the gym on a sturdy box. It definitely would have been ideal to use that for 30 days, but I made do with what I had in my living room. So what happened throughout and at the end of 30 days? If I'm being honest, not much. I didn't develop any low back pain and maybe I gained some flexibility in my spine, hips and hamstrings, but it wasn't a life altering experience. This isn't an exercise that significantly contributes to my personal goals. Would I recommend them? Maybe if it fits your goals, perhaps if you're a gymnast or a yoga practitioner, Obviously the progression and parameters would vary person to person. You could even potentially use this in the rehab setting to improve someone's tolerance to lumbar flexion or help them overcome their fear of it. I am definitely not saying that you have to do them and I know certain people would not tolerate them very well, but I wanted to show that lumbar flexion isn't inherently bad because our spines are strong and adaptable and lumbar flexion is a normal human movement that should not and cannot be avoided. The individuals who state that repetitive lumbar flexion is bad usually cite research by McGill and colleagues where the authors dissect the cervical spine of pigs, remove all musculature, and repetitively load a segment like C3, C4. In one paper, they applied axial compression and flexed and extended the segment up to 86,000 times in a 24 hour period. Now, these papers are important for a variety of reasons, but we can't draw the conclusion from this research to say that repetitive lumbar flexion is bad since it's not completely applicable to live humans who are adaptable. And a recent study by Bellaby et al compared the spines of a control group to cyclists who have done over 150 kilometers per week or 93 miles per week for at least the past five years which is a long time spent in sustained lumbar flexion. And they found that high volume cyclists had better intervertebral disc tissue quality than otherwise healthy but non-sporting people, which was characterized by greater disc height and better hydration and glycosaminoglycan content, particularly in the nucleus pulposus. What about lifting? Well, Kingma and colleagues in 2010 showed that with regards to lifting a weighted box off the ground from its base using a stoop, squat, or weightlifting technique, compression forces showed no significant differences between any of the lifting techniques, and forward shear forces were higher in the weightlifting technique than in the stoop and squat lifting, despite less lumbar flexion. They concluded that there does not seem to be a convincing argument for healthy subjects to prefer one lifting technique over another when a large box needs to be lifted at the bottom. There's also many studies showing that it's impossible to maintain a neutral spine during squatting and hinging maneuvers, including a paper by McGill and Marshall in 2012, reporting that there was up to 26 degrees of lumbar flexion in the bottom portion of this kettlebell swing. Now, I'm not saying to abandon all technique. There is significant value in keeping the load close, 
bracing and trying to maintain stiffness in the trunk during a heavy lift, and we see that with strongmen and competitive power lifters. But the spine is adaptable, and rather than thinking about lumbar flexion as this dichotomous good or bad, we're better off thinking about when we might benefit from more or less in a given circumstance. Thank you so much for watching. If you want me to do another dangerous movement for 30 days to see if I can adapt to it, leave your suggestions in the comments below and I might give it a shot. Peace.